Tonight, breaking news out of Hong Kong. Bowing to pressure, the controversial extradition bill that sparked massive protests is dead. We'll take you to Hong Kong. He has uh, an enormous wealth. Uh, the charges are very serious. How Jeffrey Epstein allegedly abused dozens of young girls and recruited more victims. Why it took 17 years to get here. The Alberta community taking a stand against conversion therapy. They, they taught us that nobody is born gay. What it's like to try to be talked out of who you are. This is The National. We begin with breaking news tonight. The controversial extradition bill that unleashed weeks of protest in Hong Kong is now dead. The bill would have allowed Hong Kong people to be sent to mainland China to face trial. It is Tuesday morning in Hong Kong, and the chief executive, Carrie Lam, made the announcement just a short time ago. The cause of all these um, uh, grievances and confrontations is an exercise to amend the Fugitive Offenders Ordinance. I have almost immediately put a stop to the amendment exercise. But there are still lingering doubts about the government's sincerity or worries whether the government will restart the process in the Legislative Council. So I reiterate here, there is no such plan. The bill is dead. Our Sasha Petrasik is in Hong Kong. And Sasha, did this come as a surprise? Yeah, Ian, this is a stunning reversal from a Hong Kong leader who is known for being uh, uh, very, very adamant, very stubborn, and has a hard time say backing down under any circumstances. Uh, she has apologized over the past number of weeks. She has suspended the bill. She's tried everything to try to get the protesters off the streets and uh, try to send signals that this is probably not going ahead hasn't been enough, and today she actually had to back down. I spoke to a few protesters. Uh, I just had a few minutes this morning, and uh, they are surprised but extremely pleased uh, that this has actually worked. Uh, they're actually surprised that uh, they have managed to push this government because it is backed by Beijing. It has a lot of power, uh, very few checks and balances, except, of course, as we now learned, the power of uh, two million people out on the streets. But given that level of surprise, given the fact that even some of the protesters, and I saw on the National, they have told you over time that they weren't optimistic that something would change. Is there any chance that this is a ploy, that somehow the wording has been set up to allow a, a new extradition law to be introduced soon? Well, I guess soon is the key word. Uh, I think legally and politically, it is very difficult to bring this particular law back. I think this one is dead. Of course, there's nothing that prevents the government from introducing something similar in the future. But as Carrie Lam and this government, and ultimately Beijing, which controls a lot of things here, including the legislature, ultimately, uh, this has been a warning that if they do, it will be at their own political risk, and frankly, at the risk of the streets of Hong Kong, because I can tell you, if this comes back in any form soon, this place will explode again. Already Tuesday morning in Hong Kong. Sasha, thank you. It is a criminal case that's been years in the making. An American multimillionaire with ties to a lot of familiar and influential names. Once given a secret plea deal and shielded from prosecution, tonight Jeffrey Epstein sits behind bars as an unsealed indictment reveals new details of his alleged crimes, sexually abusing teenage girls and then using them to recruit more victims. He's pleaded not guilty. Among his once close political connections, Donald Trump, the president, is actually his neighbor in Palm Beach, Florida. They've attended events together and traveled on Epstein's private jet. Another guest on that plane, former U.S. President Bill Clinton. But Epstein's powerful relationships also extend across the pond to the Queen's son, Prince Andrew. But that influence and extreme wealth were used against him in court today. Kim Brunhuber has the details of Epstein's alleged crimes. The alleged behavior shocks the conscience. 
Jeffrey Epstein is accused of running a sex trafficking network as complex and well-organized as it is disturbing. A sexual pyramid scheme involving recruiters from around the world assigned to lure girls as young as 14. As a 16-year-old, Virginia Roberts was working at Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort in Palm Beach when she says she was recruited to be a masseuse for Epstein. It ended with sexual abuse and intercourse and then a pat on the back. You've done a really good job. Here's $200. Victims say they were offered money to recruit others. I'm really, really sad that I brought other girls my age and even younger into a world that they should have never been introduced to. And now, possibly new evidence seized from Epstein's $56 million home in New York. Evidence including uh, nude photographs of what appear to be underage girls. These photographs were labeled and locked in a safe. The case is attracting even more attention because Epstein had faced federal indictments for these alleged crimes in Florida more than a decade ago. But he struck a plea deal on lesser state charges and served only 13 months in jail. The prosecutor behind the deal? Alexander Acosta, then the United States attorney in Miami, now Donald Trump's labor secretary. Trump has long been connected to the multimillionaire, saying in 2002, he's a lot of fun to be with. It is even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do, and many of them are on the younger side. Legal experts say it's possible some of Epstein's powerful acquaintances could be investigated too. Are they going to go after President Trump? Are they going to go after some other elected official who was part of Mr. Epstein's misconduct? Who knows? Prosecutors say they've spoken to more victims and are asking for anyone with information about the alleged crimes to come forward. My office will not rest until perpetrators of these types of crimes are brought to justice. Victims' voices, including the many voices of Epstein's alleged victims, must be heard. Given the number of people allegedly involved, it's likely this investigation could unearth even more victims and possibly more suspects. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. These allegations date back nearly two decades, and it's been 11 years since Epstein got that plea deal. So why are prosecutors taking another run at the charges now? While the charge conduct is from a number of years ago, it is still profoundly important to the many alleged victims. The prosecutors credit investigative journalists in helping them reopen this case. I'm not going into uh, any dealings with uh, Maine Justice, uh, nor am I going to go into uh, any aspects of how our investigation originated. I will say that we were assisted from uh, some excellent investigative journalism. Last fall, the Miami Herald brought to light how then U.S. Attorney Alexander Acosta handled the case, uncovering that the plea deal shut down an ongoing FBI probe and granted immunity to any possible co-conspirator. And since then, the journalism has continued. Sometimes easy to walk away and just let things happen, but I just con felt that I had to keep pursuing it. As to why prosecutors were able to indict Epstein yet again, despite his previous deal. That agreement only binds, by its terms, only binds the Southern District of Florida. The Southern District of New York is not bound by that agreement and is not a signatory to that agreement. That very agreement will now be the focus of Epstein's defense. If convicted, Epstein could face up to 45 years in prison. He will have another opportunity to get bail next Monday during his detention hearing. Let's turn now to two major political issues being talked about on both sides of the border today, energy and the environment, and if they can coexist. In a moment, a closer look at how Donald Trump is praising his own environmental record without acknowledging climate change. But let's start here in Canada and a group of premiers united against the carbon tax. Today, they met in Alberta. Carolyn Dunn now on their message for Ottawa. Howdy, folks. Are you having a good stampede? Nothing like pancakes and politics to draw a crowd, especially during Stampede. Alberta's Jason Kenney invited those he called like-minded premiers to be part of his Stampede Breakfast Club. As gifts, the conservative-leaning leaders got traditional white hats and belt buckles. This is not about parties, this is uh, about prosperity. And those who have the same ideas about how to achieve it on issues like resource development, pipelines, interprovincial trade, and the federal carbon tax. 
Despite two recent provincial court losses, the premiers say that legal battle isn't over yet. We are going to come together um, with our with our ministers of justice in the in the weeks ahead to ensure that we are going to be putting forward the best presentation to the to the Supreme Court. But today's political show of force is also about winning over public sentiment to use as leverage to sway the Trudeau government, especially with a federal election looming. My hope is that the current federal government returns to its initial promise of a cooperative approach to federalism. Um, none of us, nor do our citizens, appreciate a message that it's either Ottawa's way or the highway. There's this will by the current government to just tax people more and think it'll get better because everyone will feel like I'm, I'm playing a, a guilty tax here. But tomorrow in Saskatoon, when this group of five becomes 13 provincial and territorial leaders, they won't all be singing from the same songbook. On many subjects, we'll be all together, but on other ones, like the pipeline, we won't be uh, in line. Yeah! So the Pancake Summit attendees have every motivation to shout out their position. Like-minded premiers flexing political muscle to try to convince those who may not be so like-minded they've got the sizzle to fight Ottawa and win. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Now to the United States, where today President Donald Trump devoted an entire speech to a subject he rarely talks about, the environment. He spoke to a gathering of conservatives, including senior advisors who used to lobby for the oil and gas industries. The president touted a range of policies he says have made the U.S. a world environmental leader. But as Stephen D'Souza tells us, for some, his list of achievements is a tough sell. The speech was billed as America's environmental leadership. It might as well have been called Make America Clean Again. We want the cleanest air. We want crystal clean water. Donald Trump boasted of his administration's accomplishments cleaning up toxic sites, America's top ranking in access to clean drinking water, and declining air pollution. We're doing a very tough job and not everybody knows it. It's so damaging that there almost aren't words uh, to capture um, how it will play out. But for a president who has denied his own scientist claims about climate change, critics say his words ring hollow. I would say that is comical if his policies weren't so dangerous. Uh, I've often said that his policies, both around air pollution and water pollution, should actually come with a label, uh, almost like cigarettes, that says that this policy is dangerous for your health. From pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord to weakening vehicle emission rules, to eliminating dozens of regulations meant to protect the environment, Ali says Trump is taking the country backwards. They have not moved forward on one piece of legislation that has actually helped to protect people's lives. He says even Trump's own pronouncements about clean air are undercut by his support for the coal industry. We're going to have clean coal, really clean coal. Today's speech, however, may have been more about the political climate. Polls show Trump ranks far behind Democrats on environmental issues. We have only one America. We have only one planet. But while he talked about air and water quality, there was little mention of reducing emissions to address rising global temperatures, the crux of the climate change crisis. The president often does this apples and oranges types of thing just to confuse folks. In fact, while he talked a lot about how a strong economy is good for the environment, President Trump never once mentioned climate change in his speech. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Washington. So who were Trump's environmental advisors in the room with him today? Well, one is Andrew Wheeler. He's the current head of the Environmental Protection Agency. He's also a lawyer who once lobbied on behalf of a coal company. The other, the Secretary of the U.S. Interior, David Burhart, also a lawyer, and he used to act for the Independent Petroleum Association of America. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on The National. The RCMP has reached another settlement in a class action sexual harassment lawsuit which could exceed $100 million. Well, no amount of money can compensate these women for the harms that they've endured. We hope that this settlement is indicative of a better tomorrow. Today's settlement applies to women who are employed in non-policing roles such as administrative staff and contractors. Lawyers expect 1,500 women to file claims of harassment and assault. In 2016, another settlement was reached involving female RCMP officers. It was also worth $100 million. 
The groping case against actor Kevin Spacey has hit a potential roadblock. The man making the claim was asked in court if he deleted messages from his phone, but he refused to testify, invoking his right to refuse to incriminate himself. Spacey's lawyers say the case could be dismissed. He's the sole witness that can establish the circumstances of his allegation on the night in question. This case needs to be dismissed, and I believe it needs to be dismissed today. The actors accused of groping a busboy at a bar in Massachusetts in 2016. For the second day, some Rogers and Freedom Mobile customers have been left confused and frustrated. Both companies have been struggling to fix outages on their networks, which left some people unable to make or receive calls. The outages started Sunday with customers reporting drop calls and no calls at times. Winnipeg and Toronto police also said some 911 calls were cut short. Answers as to what caused the problem have been hard to get. Instead, just acknowledgments of the problem and apologies from both companies. By this afternoon, Rogers said only a very limited number of customers were still affected. Text messages, internet and data services were working fine. Even on a good day, though, there are still big wireless coverage gaps in Canada. In 2017, the federal government said 14% of major roads in this country didn't have adequate wireless coverage, and that can put travelers at risk. Take a look at the national picture. This is the combined coverage by Rogers, Bell, and TELUS. According to their own maps, you can see just how much space is left out. And as Stu Mills discovered, just because an area appears to be covered doesn't mean it always is. Clayton, Ontario is only 20 kilometers from the city of Ottawa, but last February, Susan Harrington was reminded of just how rural it is. She was brushing a horse when it got spooked and slammed her into a stall where she collapsed. I laid there for quite a while thinking I would get my breath back, but it never, I never got my breath back. With four broken ribs and a punctured lung, Harrington needed help. The only way to get it, crawl into the barnyard and up a hill where her 911 call finally went through. At the Clayton General Store, another story of a close call. Chris Armstrong's teenage children were driving to school on an icy morning when they hit black ice and skidded off the bridge and into the river. They survived, but when they tried to call their parents... It was the third try before he could get through. Um, the other two tries, he could hear me, but I couldn't hear him, or vice versa. Uh, there was just no service. It wasn't very good at all. What were you thinking at that moment? Oh, panic mode. It's not supposed to be difficult to find cell service here. Rogers shows this area as blanketed in LTE coverage. Same thing for Bell. But much of this town is a dead zone. This former Nortel telephone engineer uses a special app to map out the places around Clayton where you can get a strong LTE cell signal. And it shows there's nothing at the general store. But strangely, out here, seven kilometers from town on a quiet country road, a strong signal. I'd like to see Bell Canada or Rogers or Telus uh, do what they say is covered here. It's spotty at best. Bell concedes that optimal coverage may not be available at all times. Rogers says it continues to monitor the quality of its coverage in the area. Last Thursday, three levels of government connected to promise $152 million to fill the gaps in Eastern Ontario cell coverage. But with no tower approvals in place and no timelines, it could be years before emergency calls made here go through. Stu Mills, CBC News, Clayton. Still ahead on the National, a summer vacation destination right out of a Stephen King novel in Newfoundland. Plus, once dormant volcanoes awakened by global warming, we get an exclusive look coming up. And as a city in Alberta moves to ban anti-gay conversion therapy, we go in-depth. It was a constant loop of shame and anger and hatred toward myself. What it means for people who have gone through it, why this city is doing it now, and the ongoing protests for LGBTQ rights in Alberta. Right after this. Alberta's United Conservative government is facing criticism on two fronts over LGBTQ rights in the province. On one hand, it's being criticized for limiting protections. On the other, it's being taken to task for not taking a stronger stand. 
Introduced to considerable protest last month, Bill 8 passed on Friday after a marathon filibuster lasting almost two days. It rolls back some legal protections in Alberta schools for student groups that provide safe and supportive environments for LGBTQ youth, known as gay straight alliances. Now schools won't have to immediately allow them at students' request. It also removes privacy protections, allowing schools to notify parents if their child joins one. Some rights groups also worry the Alberta government is not doing enough to prevent so-called conversion therapy, which the Canadian Psychological Association opposes as harmful. It attempts to change people's sexual orientation, gender identity or expression through counselling, medication or religious practices. The United Conservative government says it does not condone conversion therapy. In fact, only a handful of provinces have restricted it, and only partially. But as Rafi Bujikanin explains, frustration that Alberta hasn't, along with that anger over Bill 8, has prompted one Alberta city to take its own stand. I wish I'd come out when I was, like, a teenager. Kevin Schultz spent a long time struggling with his identity as a gay man. More than a decade ago, he signed up with a church group hoping he'd emerge straight after seeing counselors. The bottom line message that they gave was that we were broken, that because of our sexuality, um, we were broken people before God. We, they, they taught us that nobody is born gay. It took a lot for Schultz to leave. What made his decision was when another participant experienced a psychotic break and then the only advice he received was to pray. I remember leaving the, the group that night and having no idea what I'd do next because I'd never been a part of the gay community. I didn't know where to find it. And this is the right thing to do. Today, the city of St. Albert took its own step, passed a motion ordering its committees looking into banning conversion therapy. We're the ones that can make a difference today and that's, that's always been our role. Uh, municipalities have a long history of making these kind of value statements. Despite ever-growing support for LGBTQ communities in cities across Canada, so far it's been largely up to higher levels of government to come up with policies banning conversion therapy. Our government established a working group to figure out the best way to ban this practice altogether. In Alberta, the previous NDP government was looking into it, but the new United Conservative government stopped funding efforts and won't say why. Our position on that is exactly the same as, as the NDP's was. They were in office for four years, uh, and uh, so our position is the same as the NDP's. It's frustration with that position and the passing of Bill 8 that prompted the St. Albert campaign. St. Albert um, could actually lend a small voice towards a bigger voice to the elimination of it. And other municipalities are listening. Some Calgary councillors are suggesting they may study a similar motion and Edmonton's looking into it too. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, St. Albert. Conversion therapy is partially restricted in Ontario, Nova Scotia and Manitoba. And this spring, a Liberal senator tabled a bill to ban the advertising of conversion therapy services in Canada. So today in 2019, conversion therapy largely takes place underground. You, you won't be able to walk into a licensed counselor's office and ask them to engage in this practice because it would be deemed to be unethical and unprofessional. So we largely see conversion therapy happening underground in uh, faith-based communities, um, which makes it harder to detect, but also more dangerous the more underground a practice like this goes. Quite frankly, it tells them that they're wrong, that they're disordered, or that uh, they're uh, an abomination to nature or to their God. And so now imagine that you're a young person who experiences that, and no matter how hard you try or how hard you pray, you can't change who you are. This is what lends young people to taking their own lives. It can lead to uh, depression, self-loathing, hating yourself, hating who you are, um, self-harming behaviors such as cutting or drug and alcohol abuse to um, negatively cope with uh, the stress uh, associated with conversion therapy all the way up to people taking their own lives. Even though some adults of their own free will seek out some version of conversion therapy, Wells says the practice is simply dangerous regardless of age. There are all kinds of practices that we restrict adults from engaging in, even if they should desire, such as driving a car without a seatbelt, 
um, driving um, their motor vehicle while intoxicated or impaired, uh, because we know that this just doesn't harm themselves, but it's detrimental to the values and beliefs of our society. Those who've experienced conversion therapy often describe it as difficult and painful. Today, we reached out to two Canadians who have gone through it, and they agreed to share their stories. I went to conversion therapy in 2014. I did it in my early 20s, and I wanted to get the love and the appreciation of my dad, and so I would fight however I could to do that. It was uh, 1989 when I was 24 years old, and, and uh, my experience, this conversion therapy, was with a psychiatrist. When I went to the conversion therapy, I thought it would change my sexual orientation. They said your attractions will diminish. It could be, but it, it's more so that your shame will increase. I'd been raised staunch Catholic, and uh, there was a lot of arguments in my family, and I was isolated and depressed and struggling with with uh, where to go in my future, and I, and I couldn't reconcile my sexuality with, with uh, how my parents and my family felt about it. I was abused by the people that are inside of the group. I, I was called hateful things. Some of the experiences that I experienced would be uh, picturing my dad as a punching bag and whacking it over and over and over again with a baseball bat. And what that did was it reinforced a hate where in religion, it's interesting because there's no, there's no hate and malice in religion. I had been sexually abused as a child, and the doctor told me very early uh, in treatment with him that the sexual abuse had created this false idea of being gay. And so our goal in my therapy with him would be to face the trauma of my history, uh, to work through it, and my innate heterosexuality would resurface. And so to reach this goal, he started to prescribe me psychiatric medication. Treatment was primarily uh, primal screen therapy as well, before reparenting sessions with him and a woman he'd hired as a surrogate mother to help nurture me back into my heterosexuality. It made me not trust. It made me not trust licensed mental health professionals. It may be closed off. I, I, um, I just feel so hurt by people that I thought that I could trust. I did feel suicidal. Um, it's hard to talk about. Let me just... <sighs> when I immediately left this treatment, it's not so much that I wanted to kill myself as I thought I was already dead. I mean, I would just walk around the city just shell-shocked. I mean, I was ex extremely anxious. I mean, I would just break out sobbing. I couldn't hold down a job, uh, panic-stricken. I live as a gay man. I, I am happy. Um, I'm happier. Um, I know what it is, and I know what, I, I know what it is not. Certainly, I, I reestablished my life as a gay man, and, and I'm completely comfortable with that. But I felt shamed by this doctor for being gay. And to resist that type of silencing shame, because shame just silences people. I mean, it kills people. To me, I needed to write the truth. Conversion therapy is partially restricted in Ontario, Nova Scotia, and Manitoba. And there's a bill in the works in Alberta to at least regulate it. Next on The National, a fight over the truth about what's happening in Lake Winnipeg. It's like anything else. If you put it in the paper enough times, then people will start to believe it. If we keep doing what we're doing, um, uh, we'll, we'll um, drive the population into collapse. What's going on with the walleye? Next. Another gray whale has been found on the coast of British Columbia, the animal on the shores of Haida Gwaii. This is the eighth whale carcass spotted in BC waters this year. 
The necropsy didn't determine what caused the death. Further south, dozens of whales washed up on the U.S. coast. Officials there saying many were malnourished. And on the east coast of Canada, a major operation underway today to save three whales in New Brunswick. Officials on a Transport Canada plane spotted the North Atlantic right whales tangled in fishing gear near the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Teams from the U.S. and Canada set off this morning to help, but they have to find them first. Six North Atlantic right whales have died in the Gulf of St. Lawrence since early June. There's a food fight underway in Manitoba, and it's all about fish, walleye, widely known as pickerel, and are prized for their mild, sweet flavor. But biologists and fishermen are at odds over how many should be taken from Lake Winnipeg. The CBC's Bart Bartley Kivas shows us why. Off the shore of Hecla Island, Inner Svensson hauls fish in off Lake Winnipeg. The most valuable is walleye, the lifeblood of his business, and he says the nets have been full. Overall, it's been a terrific season. Just like the last, you know, 10, 15 years, it hasn't been any different, better or worse than any other. Commercial fishers all over Lake Winnipeg say there are plenty of walleye in this inland sea. Scientists and regulators don't share that sunny outlook. They fear the stock is in danger. Provincial biologists say the fish are growing slowly, maturing later, and are often getting caught before they can spawn. Since a peak of about 2008 and 2009, the catch has steadily declined for the fishers, and I think angling success has also declined. To protect the walleye, the province is reducing how much fish can be caught by buying back commercial quotas. It's also increasing the mesh size on gill nets so smaller fish can go free. When you see that the trend line is going in the wrong direction uh, over a long period of time, you can, you can extrapolate um, what, that, what that means and where that will lead you. This independent biologist says the province needs to do even more. If we keep doing what we're doing, um, uh, we'll, we'll um, drive the population into collapse as it was driven into collapse in the late 1960s. The fishers don't agree. They don't trust the biologists or their data because the numbers don't line up with what they see on the lake. And they've hired their own scientists to combat what they call misinformation about walleye stocks. Still, the province is moving forward with its new regulations, potentially threatening the livelihood of Svensson's family business. I've been very fortunate. I'm fourth generation. My son will be fifth, and hopefully there'll be sixth and seventh to come. Bartley Kivas, CBC News, at Hecla Village in Manitoba. Tomorrow night on The National, we've got another underwater tale. This one, though, in Hamilton, Ontario, where, get this, giant goldfish are tearing at vegetation and threatening local species. How did they get there, and how can biologists fight them? Here's Cass Rusi with a preview. What? My, what? <laughs> what are they doing in the harbor? These are meant to be in a fish bowl. Uh, these fish are getting into the harbor. Uh through um, active release, people are releasing their pets into the harbor, or they're getting into the harbor, I think, through um, people's private ponds or stormwater management ponds. Why are they so big? I don't remember goldfish uh, being that big. Uh, I think they just, they have the resources. They have an unlimited supply of food here in the harbor for them. And still ahead on tonight's show, a surprising and troubling effect of climate change. We revisit our exclusive trip to visit once dormant Canadian volcanoes rumbling again because of rising global temperatures. We've taken the top off our pressure cooker. There's a true value in trying to understand what is happening here, what are the changes, so that people can prepare. I'm Jamie Poisson. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Frontburner, third parties wield plenty of influence over Canadian elections. So what can new election rules do about them? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Trouble is brewing beneath the surface of a BC mountain range. Volcano researchers from Simon Fraser University are keeping an anxious watch and our journalists were the first to record their work. The scientists argue that climate change is destabilizing volcanoes around the world. 
In B.C., not far from Whistler, Mount Meagre shows signs of dangerous things to come. Tonight, we're revisiting an exclusive look from the CBC's Laura Lynch. This is the British Columbia that's familiar around the world. Stunning peaks, deep valleys, the coastal range that's been labeled supernatural. But there's a lurking threat hiding amongst these mountains and all that ice. We've flown here to Mount Meagre, northwest of Whistler, where scientists from Simon Fraser University are on a risky mission to a rumbling giant, a volcano that's cracking apart even as we arrive. And out of any volcano, the top three gases are number one, water vapor, then carbon dioxide, and then tiny amounts of hydrogen sulfide. Volcanologist Glenn Williams-Jones is warning the crew about the poisonous gases spewing from what's called a fumarole. It's just one of the dangers here. The first time I was here, there was an open crevasse. Williams-Jones leads us up to the very edge. Click into any of those three loops. Our guides help anchor us so we won't slip into the hole where the gas is so concentrated it could kill us. But coming here is the only way to answer the question, when will catastrophe strike? This big, massive mountain is rotten. It's been growing for two million years. And over that time period, we've had all of these gases and acid fluids coming through the rock and slowly but surely changing that into weaker rock. Mount Meagre is also the site of Canada's most recent explosive eruption just over 2,400 years ago. But that is the mere blink of an eye for those who study volcanoes. It was comparable to the 1980 explosion of Mount St. Helens in Washington state. 57 people died when the entire north face of the mountain collapsed, allowing the volcano to explode. Oh, yeah. Those images of destruction weigh on the mind of Williams-Jones as he carefully sets up his equipment. Okay, that's working. To measure the things he can't see. That's what I want to hear. The invisible fumes. It's getting bigger. The fumes are bad. They smell like rotten eggs. But a bigger problem for Williams-Jones is how much the fumaroles have grown in the two years he's observed them as the glacier retreats. And as the ice shrinks, his concern grows because we've taken the top off our pressure cooker. So it's highly theoretical, uh, you know, but it's, it's uh, important. It's not just an esoteric academic exercise. There's a true value in trying to understand what is happening here, what are the changes, so that people can prepare. There are actually three fumaroles here. And as Williams-Jones steps carefully toward another one, an alarm stops us cold. Two parts of H2S. The smell of the hydrogen sulfide is not strong at all. So there's hydrogen sulfide here, but not enough to keep him and his guide from exploring a worrying discovery. So we are right underneath the glacier now. They say it's too it's dangerous really for us, the, so Williams-Jones agrees to wear a camera on his helmet as he peers over the edge. OK, let's see what we can see. Oh, it just drops away. Melting glacier ice has carved out a cave, allowing the scientists to see deeper under the ice than ever before. Listen to how long it goes. They use a primitive tool, a rock, to get a sense of the depth. 30, 30 40 meters, maybe. Yeah, no, this is spectacular. It's not often that you get to see underneath the bottom of a glacier. It's yet another alarming indication of how the mountain is becoming unstable and ever closer to crashing down. And that's where Gio Roberti comes in. The PhD student is hiking the steep slopes, looking for trouble. Using different types of remote and field-based technique, we were able to map numerous landslides. And uh, one of the most concerning is right there. Roberti is pointing to a crack in this massive rock face. It's moving and deepening by centimeters each month. It's very likely that this slope will fail very soon, generating a very big event. The event, as he calls it, could be devastating. And Roberti doesn't even have to imagine the impact of a landslide. All he has to do is look back at what happened on this same mountain eight years ago. 
It was the biggest landslide in Canadian history. The debris traveled 13 kilometers, destroying bridges, roads and equipment. Seismic waves were felt as far away as Washington State and Alaska. In this alpine setting here now, things are changing way faster. This slide will happen, Roberti says, and soon, and it will be much bigger. So if the 2010 landslide travel about 13 kilometers, this one is about 10 times bigger, and this one could travel 20, 30 kilometers and eventually impact populated area downstream. The scientists here agree the risk to human life is unacceptable. They want permanent monitoring equipment placed here to warn of earth tremors, landslides, even the remote chance of volcanic activity. Right now, government isn't prepared to pay. If we had the budgets, we could do orders of magnitude more uh, on this system. And it's not, it's, it's both trying to understand the basic fundamental scientific questions, but also trying to understand the hazard implications. Actually having active monitoring and an alarm system so that we can respond. The ghostly churn of gas and steam will continue, as will the slow disappearance of the glacier. As the team departs with fresh data to study, the worries remain. Laura Lynch, CBC News, Mount Meagre, British Columbia. We checked in with Williams Jones again today. He and his team have partnered with other universities and the private sector and are hoping to have monitoring equipment installed on the mountain by the end of the summer. They'll be able to track gas emissions, take daily photos of the slope they're concerned about and listen for earthquakes and landslides. Incredible pictures there. Next on The National, the abandoned amusement park in Newfoundland that's become a different kind of tourist attraction. And Newfoundland, because it's so isolated, does not have many amusement parks. So one guy even said to us, he was like, oh yeah, this was like the Disneyland of Newfoundland. Ah, not so much anymore. The story behind its new popularity in our moment, but first. In case you missed it, a community near Windsor, Ontario is dealing with a double pest kind of problem. On one hand, fish flies. This time of year, they swarm into waterside communities and die in droves, blanketing driveways and streets. The other pest, well, that one's human. In Lakeshore, Ontario, people have been tampering with the street lights, shutting them off so the fish flies stay away. I think that they shouldn't have to do it themselves, but I don't blame them for doing it. The town is asking people to stop it, citing the cost of constantly turning them back on. Residents have a solution for that. The town should just shut them off. Oh, well, it'd be nice if the city would turn the lights off. From the mayor, though, this is just nature. Put up with it and don't mess with the street lights. A deserted amusement park in rural Newfoundland is becoming a popular tourism spot. It may not offer any functional rides, but for some, it's still thrilling. All that's left of the Trinity train loop is some broken glass, busted rides, and graffiti, but people are flocking to the area to capture a uniquely spooky part of Canada. And that is tonight's moment. It was a really big community hub at the time, so we were told that people went there every weekend to, you know, camp out where they would bring their kids to go on the rides or go around the train loop. One guy even said to us, he was like, oh yeah, this was like the Disneyland of Newfoundland. I all sort of romanticized the concept of like an, an, an empty amusement park. And then you have this one that's like abandoned and you'd all see pictures of it on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or something. And it's, there's, there was like this decrepit um, Ferris wheel that was just kind of standing and it's all its decay left behind for people to do whatever they wanted to it really. And you can see that that's really what they did. You know, it's graffiti everywhere. Uh, like, it, it's really, it's really something now, broken glass. I don't know what it is about Trinity, but the way that the fog rolls in there, it's very unique. It's very like dreadful and eerie. So it's one of those nice secrets, I think, that people enjoy seeking out and discovering. So I actually think that's kind of cool. Maybe that's, I'm creepy too, but I think that's a pretty neat like pilgrimage, particularly if you grew up going there as a kid or something, to go back and see that they've just sort of let it uh, you know, fall apart. I think it was after the hurricane, they just couldn't salvage any more of it. I, I was going to say that there's something interesting about Instagrammers, you know, that but, but you're an Instagrammer, so. Who are you? I, 
I, would you go to a place like that and take Just pictures? Just for Instagram? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm that into Instagram. It's mostly about my shoes, Ian, as you know. <laughs> I know. I do know that. <laughs> Good for you. I, uh, there is something hopeful about amusement parks, and, yes. and uh, especially when you hope that it will be the Disneyland of, in this case, rural Newfoundland. But yes. sometimes it uh, doesn't work out that way. So uh, it's, I'm glad to see it's getting a second life as a site for non-shoe Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> that is The National for Monday, July the 8th. Good night. Good night.